Good morning, and welcome to our second health talk of the morning. As Karen said, it's great to see such a full house today on a beautiful Saturday morning. And I'd like to welcome all of you who are joining us online. My name is Dana Hayes, and I am a local resident here in the Bay Area and a member of the Stanford Medicine Community Council. Before we get started, I want to remind everyone that there will be a live Q&A after our presentation. You can submit your questions using the QR code in your program, or if you're watching online, there should be a QR code on your screen. And for all of our attendees, both in person and online, the slides shown during this presentation will be available to view after the event at healthmatters.stanford.edu. Now I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Frank Longo. He's a professor of neurology and neurological sciences here at Stanford and the former chair of that department. Today, Dr. Longo will be talking about the groundbreaking work that's taking place in the area of cognitive health, including here at Stanford. He will share how fortunate we are to be living in a time of a neuroscience revolution with more ways to detect and treat neurological conditions than at any other time in history. He'll also share information and practical tips that we can use starting today to keep our brains healthy into the future. Now please well, join me in welcoming Dr. Frank Longo. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Okay, well, th thank you, Dana, for that nice introduction, and thank you, everyone, for being here. It's a, it's a pleasure for me to be here at, at Health Matters. I'd like to thank Carla and the team that has made this uh, event possible. I'd also like to thank Dr. Katsumoto for her wonderful talk that she just gave. It helps me uh, discuss a few areas about, about the brain. So for centuries, the brain has been this black box, and we really didn't know what was going on in the brain in living people. And during the past few years, technologies have become available that are rapidly changing that. So we're in an explosion of brain science. Two of the drivers of that are imaging technology, some of which was developed here at Stanford, and another technology we call omics, genomics, proteomics, the ability to measure thousands of genes and thousands of proteins in the blood or the spinal fluid all at the same time in living people. And with those technologies, we finally have a window inside the brain, and that's allowing us to accelerate uh, strategies to uh, promote brain health and to come up with therapies. And I'll share some of those new developments uh, with you today. So let's look at our cognitive health span. All of us are on this spectrum. If we're lucky, many of us start with normal cognition. And at some point around age 30, most of us start to develop what we call age-related cognitive impairment. What does that mean? That means a little bit of more challenge in short-term memory and some more challenges in what we call executive function, the ability to multitask. Now, it's not all bad. With aging, some cognitive functions can improve. For example, judgment or association or verbal abilities can actually improve all the way into our 80s. But we're all on this journey of, of age-related cognitive impairment at a minimum. Now, starting in our 60s, in between age, say, 65 and 75, a little over 20% of people will have mild cognitive impairment. What does that mean? That means some cognitive impairment, often involving short-term memory, that's decreased compared to your age match controls, but not severe enough to affect day-to-day -day function. So it's called MCI, mild cognitive impairment. You'll hear that term quite a bit. Now, if you have mild cognitive impairment for each year, you have a 10 or 15% chance of going on to develop a full dementia. Dementia is a broad term. It means enough cognitive impairment to significantly affect day-to-day -day function. That's what a dementia is. There are many kinds of dementia. I've listed three of the most common here, Alzheimer's, vascular, and Lewy body dementia. Today I'll be speaking about Alzheimer's quite a bit, but the principles of Alzheimer's apply to these other forms of dementia in many ways uh, as well. Alzheimer's is by far the most common form of dementia. It accounts about, for about two-thirds of the dementias that we see in our clinic. Let's look inside the brain of an Alzheimer's patient. There are three critical processes here. One is the accumulation of the substance called amyloid. What's amyloid? Amyloid is the fragment of a normal protein 
Uh, and it's an abnormal fragment that accumulates with age, but especially with Alzheimer's. We don't know why it accumulates, uh, but it's damaging to the connections between neurons. The second pathology, or uh, there's a protein called tau. It has some normal functions inside the nerve cells or neurons, but, but abnormal forms of it, that dark substance inside those neurons will start accumulating. That causes the neurons to degenerate. And the third process is neuroinflammation. Uh, Dr. Katsumoto talked about the importance of inflammation. The brain has its version of inflammation, and there are cells in the brain called microglia cells. Those are the brain's inflammatory cells. Um, and in the upper picture there on the right is a normal microglia cell in a, in a happy, non-activated, healthy state. But when it gets activated by brain injury, by poor diet, whatever it is, it has this plumped up uh, appearance that you can see there. And when, in the, when it's in that state, it's secreting cytokines and inflammatory chemicals that again affect these connections between the nerve cells. These three pathologies will come up over and over again if you're a student of brain health. So remember what these look like. Okay, and the bottom line is that we want to protect our synaptic connections. So synapses are the connections between the nerve cells. We about have about 100 trillion of them in our brain. And the most delicate part of that synaptic connection is called the spines, those little nubs there. So there's a dendrite or an axon. It has those little nubs or spines, and those, that's the heart and soul of the synaptic connection. So if you're interested in brain health, what your interest is is not losing these synaptic connections. That's the bottom line. How did, what's that have to do with Alzheimer's? So we talked about amyloid and tau and inflammatory cells. All three of these processes cause degeneration and failure of the synaptic connections. So this, this is what we're dealing with. So let's delve a little deeper into this concept of, of the synaptic spine. On the left here is a picture, again, of that synaptic connection and the spine shown in green there. And on the right is this fascinating study, one of my favorite studies, where they looked inside human brain and they're looking along the dendrite or the axon there on the top panel. And they're looking at those little nubs or the spines. And the top panel are just aged match people with normal cognition. And then the lower two panels are people whose brains are filled with amyloid and tau, like a typical Alzheimer's patient. But a small number of those patients with amyloid and tau in the brain have normal cognition, about 5% or so. So about 5% of people can have amyloid and tau in their brain and have normal cognition. The rest, the other 95% have a dementia. But if you look carefully, you can see the people with a normal cognition have a normal number of spines, a normal density of spines. Whereas if you look at the lower panel at the patients with dementia, their spines are almost gone. So it's that ability to keep that, keep that spine uh, that's important for preserving cognition. And we think we have strategies uh, for protecting these spines. So one of the ultimate therapeutic goals now, uh, if you're developing a treatment to prevent or treat Alzheimer's dementia is find a way to protect the synapse and really to protect those spines. That, that, that's our goal. The other uh, uh, thing I find fascinating about this observation is nature's done the experience, experiment for us. What nature is telling us is that there are a small number of people that have amyloid and tau in their brains, but with normal cognition, they're resilient. So this introduces the concept of resilience. Now, these are a small number of lucky people, but can we create therapeutics that confer resilience so that everyone can have the resilience rather than just a few? If you were to come to the Stanford Memory Clinic uh, today, we have a you know, big, uh, great Stanford Memory Clinic here. I'm privileged uh, to be one of the uh, neurologists working there. This is how we assess you. If you're worried about cognitive loss or getting it, or do you have it? We take a careful history because we need to know the time course of, of any symptoms that might be there. We do a careful neurologic exam. We're looking for subtle clues. Maybe there are subtle clues of Parkinson's, for example. We need to know that. Uh, we do a careful cognitive exam that's very quantitative. We compare you to your age match uh, peers. We do a brain MRI scan as shown in the picture here, a normal and Alzheimer's patient. 
Now, the MRI scan cannot detect Alzheimer's, cannot detect Lewy body dementia. Why are we doing the brain scan? It can show a little shrinkage, uh, but that's not specific to any particular process. We get a little shrinkage with age. We're doing the brain scan to look for other things that can affect cognition. Is there a brain tumor there? Did this patient have a series of small strokes we didn't know about? Does this patient have too much fluid on the brain? All of those things can affect cognition, uh, and we wouldn't want to miss those. That's why we're doing the MRI scan. And then we'll do a few blood tests. A low B12 can affect cognition. Low thyroid can affect cognition. That's been the traditional workup for a number of years, but recently we have these newer technologies. One are amyloid and tau PET scans. I'll show you some images of those. Uh, we can do a spinal tap and get spinal fluid and get a more precise diagnosis, but we, we try to avoid doing spinal taps unless we have to do them. And then finally, uh, we can measure amyloid or tau in the blood. And this is a recent technology that we'll talk a little bit more of. Let's look at the tau and amyloid PET scans. So on the left-hand side is an amyloid PET scan. We have an Alzheimer's patient above and a normal patient below. The bright, the yellow and red colors are the accumulations of amyloid in this patient. And then on the right-hand side, we have the tau PET scan. Same thing, the bright colors are the accumulation of abnormal tau in this patient. One of the most notable aspects of this technology is that that amyloid, we can see it start to accumulate 10 or 50, 15 or 20 years before the change in cognition starts. This startled the whole field. We had no idea this was happening because we had no way of looking inside the brains in living patients, right? So just think about that. If you're destined to have your dementia start at age 70, it was during your early 50s that this amyloid started accumulating. And some people it's accumulating during their 40s, right? This process has already started. And the tau is, is later, it starts accumulating right before the symptoms start. What about the blood test? This is a technology just coming out now. It will really change many aspects of healthcare. So this is the ability to, to, with blood to measure certain abnormal forms of tau in the blood. And if those forms are abnormal, there's a greater than 95% chance that this process has already started in the brain. And there are two main applications of a blood test. Uh, we can see patients who are already having cognitive symptoms and use the blood test to help us figure out what's the cause of those cognitive symptoms? Is it Alzheimer's or not? Or, and here's the big implication in healthcare, people that have normal cognition and they just wanna get this blood test as a screening tool, what are the implications of that? In other words, you're only age 45 or 50, your cognition's perfectly fine and you can go to your primary care doctor and get this blood test done. Do you wanna do that? Do you want that information? What would you do with that information? What will this do to the healthcare system? Overnight, we'll have 20 or 30 million people in the United States wanting to see a neurologist uh, when, this, when this comes back abnormal. We're all, we're all worried about this. In fact, there are several clinics in, in both the US and Europe that are, have research programs to study what are the impacts in the primary care setting of ordering this test and getting the results. We really don't know. So you're, you're living through an experiment now. I listed four companies, or probably more now, that are offering this. This is already available. There's one company where as a patient, you can initiate this. Uh, they'll have a doctor put the order in for you. A physician has to order this, but you're the one initiating that you don't even have to deal with your own doctor and you'll get the results back. What do we do with that information? Do you wanna know that information? We can talk more about that. So what are the risk factors uh, for coming down with the dementia? There are many of them. I don't want to overwhelm you with this slide. I, I put a, a square around four that we'll talk a little bit more about today, the physical activity, the diet, social engagement, and sleep. But there are other ones uh, that people ask us about in our clinic. Stress, depression, hearing loss, interestingly, smoking, excessive alcohol consumption. I, I just want to put a note about alcohol because I get asked about this all the time. Can I drink or not? And it's, there's no agreement in the field. Uh, it's, you'll find it under a list, a, a list of risk factors, but I saw a study recently from the past year where any amount of alcohol in the, in the reasonable range was thought to be protective of not getting a dementia. So it's, it's, we really don't know yet. 
Um, there, are, there are medical issues that can contribute to getting a dementia, certain what we call anticholinergic medications. These are the first generation bladder medications or early generation antidepressive um, or some of the allergy medications. The older forms uh, increase risk of dementia by about twofold. Um, and then these medical issues, hypertension, diabetes, all of these things can uh, pr uh, promote dementia. And then traumatic brain injury earlier in our life, nothing we can do about that at, at that point. Low education, the cut points about seventh or eighth grade, people that have less of that are more likely to come down with the dementia. Air pollution, I grew up in Los Angeles, so I'm waiting for that one. Um, <laughs> and, and then finally genetics, things that we can't do much about there, but we'll talk about genetics. Let's, in fact, that's what I have next. Okay, so, Genetics is important when we're thinking about brain health. And in thinking about Alzheimer's, there's a, there's a rare form, under 2% of people, that comes on early, during the 40s typically, we call it familial Alzheimer's, where there's one gene that if a parent has it, each child has a 50% of getting it, and if they get that gene, they will 100% sure come down with Alzheimer's if they live a normal lifespan. So that's called familial Alzheimer's, but it's fairly rare. The more general form of Alzheimer's that we're dealing with we call sporadic. The onset's typically in the late 60s, it starts or so, but the mild cognitive impairment at the earlier stage can start much earlier. That's probably a result of many genes and lifestyle and environment. But there's one gene that, that is a big risk factor for sporadic Alzheimer's, that's called the APOE gene. And that gene makes a protein that carries cholesterol around the body. There are three forms of that gene, E2, E3, and E4. If you have the E4 version of this gene, you're at higher risk uh, for Alzheimer's. Now, you can get this. A doctor can order this as a blood test. You can find out if you have the E4 on, on 23andMe. So if you have no family history of Alzheimer's, your lifetime risk for all of us, if we live a full lifespan, is about 15%. So 15% of, every of everyone here will come down with Alzheimer's on average. However, if you do not have the E4 high-risk gene, you're down to 9%, so less likely to get Alzheimer's. If you do have the E4 gene, you've just doubled your risk. Now you're up to 30%. Now let's add in if you have one parent with Alzheimer's, because now your risks go up by about twofold by having a parent with Alzheimer's. And you can see if you have both a parent with Alzheimer's and you have one copy of E4, you're up to 45% risk. If you have two copies of E4, I have 60% here, but a study just came out. If you have two copies of the E4, you might be at 80 or 90% likely to come down with Alzheimer's. This is a, a powerful effect here. Now, do you want to know this information? So if you've been on 23andMe, you have to do a few extra clicks to find this out, because they kind of warn you. Do you really want to know? Why would you know or not want to know? Well, I've had patients say, I want to know if I have the high-risk APOE gene for life planning purposes, when I'll retire, et cetera. The problem is this is not real precise. You could have the E4 and never get Alzheimer's, and if you're going to get it, we don't know. So it's, it's not that easy. Uh, risk management, I'll, I'll, you know, how people manage that. Um, uh, how you, how you, there's a uh, risk here that you can be under more stress by knowing that you have the high-risk gene. Knowing you have the high-risk gene can affect your relationships with your family and friends. It can affect trying to get disability insurance, for example. You'll be asked, do you, are you aware of any risks for diseases? And how do you answer that when you know you have the E4 uh, gene? And then are there treatment implications? So far, no that if you had the high-risk gene, there's not a drug we can offer you yet. We hope we're close. But there is a study going on called the A45 study, where people who have the E4 high-risk gene and they're still normal cognition can enroll in this study and start to get treated with one of the treatments that removes amyloid from the brain. And I'll be talking about those, those treatments. <clears throat> so let's talk about four basic uh, prevention strategies, exercise, diet, cognitive exercise, and sleep. We'll start with exercise. And there are multiple studies uh, uh, showing that people who exercise have less risk for dementia. The UK Biobank, because they have a public health system in the UK, they have lots of data. Here are 78,000 people that they looked at, um, and they volunteered to wear a wrist accel accelerometer uh, over seven years to measure their steps. 
The people that had the relatively lower number of steps each day, um, still some exercise had a 25% risk reduction of getting out of getting a dementia. But the people that did 9,800 steps, look at that, 50% uh, risk reduction. This is a powerful effect. Uh, the, the biology of exercise is very powerful. Uh, a meta-analysis means that somebody summarized 29 research uh, uh, projects on exercise uh, and cognition. And they distilled this down to the bottom line that moderate to vigorous exercise uh, on average caused a 25% risk reduction during the 15-year follow-up period. An important message here is because I'm often asked, well, how much exercise? Um, the light exercise, and examples are leisurely walking or gardening, had no effect, unfortunately. So you do have to get your heart rate up to at least a moderate uh, level. We can talk more about what does moderate exercise uh, mean. But so the amount of exercise, is, the dose is important. And here's uh, an example of another study looking at physical activity and seeing if people come down with a, a dementia. So they looked, follow people over about an eight year period. And as the line goes down, people are coming down with a dementia. And you can see that the people that had low amyloid in their brain um, were, were pretty stable. They weren't coming down with dementia very often. But the people that had the high amyloid on the PET scan, uh, they were coming down with Alzheimer's much more frequently. That's in the low exercise group, the 2900 step group. But what about the people who are more active? You can see that even the people with high amyloid, if they were physically active, were not coming down with dementia nearly as often. Again, powerful biology of exercise. This is like a powerful drug, basically. Um, we want to know more about does exercise really cause a protection in the brain? And th these are two big studies that came out of Stanford recently uh, where we work with mice. Mice love to run. Um, and if you, if you put a running wheel in their cage, that's, they'll go straight to that one running wheel and start to run. And then some mice, we, we lock the running wheel so they can't run. So those are the sedentary mice, right? And then we could take blood from those mice and inject it into elderly mice. Now, if you take blood from a, a couch potato mouse and inject it in an elderly mouse, you don't see much happen. But if you take the blood from an exercising mice and inject it into an elderly mice, the elderly mouse will have improved memory function and decreased brain inflammation. That to me is really powerful biology. There's something in that blood when you exercise that has big effects on the brain. Uh, another more sophisticated study, the mice like to run on these treadmills. You can put the treadmills at different inclines and do a whole uh, getting in shape program uh, for the mouse by changing the incline and the speed of the treadmill. Same findings. And here they, they looked at male and female mice separately. But in, in the mice that succeeded in, in, or that did the training versus the sedentary, uh, they had decreased immune uh, action in their brain, improved metabolic function, and better mitochondrial function, the energy source in our cells. And for the female mice, the effects on inflammation were particularly notable. The, the benefits were particularly notable there. Um, Dr. Katsumoto did a wonderful job talking about Mediterranean, the different kinds of diets. Here's the Mediterranean diet uh, uh, pyramid you're familiar with. Anyway, overall, it's associated with a 20 to 40 percent risk reduction in dementia. And this has been looked at from many angles. People uh, can follow this study. They followed people over about 10 years looking at diet compliance to the Mediterranean diet. And the, as the lines go down, they're coming down with dementia. The people that had the high compliance with the Mediterranean diet were less likely to come down with dementia versus the people that were on the low compliance. So what Dr. Katsumoto talked about in the body and the joints appears to be applying uh, to the brain as well. And then again, the UK Biobank, uh, they have many subjects there, 60,000 subjects. Overall, uh, people on this kind of diet had a 23% risk reduction for dementia. And now that's the symptom of dementia, what happens inside the brain? And that's what the Rush Memory and Aging Project looked at. So uh, these patients volunteer to be followed, and then when they pass away, they donate their brains. And they're all rated with a Mediterranean diet score. And you could see the higher the Mediterranean diet score, the lower the Alzheimer brain pathology, and the lower the amyloid load in the brain. So they're, they're presumably influencing the amyloid load based on whether they're having Mediterranean diet or not. 
Um, and finally, uh, a prospective trial, there aren't many of these in the, in the dietary field because it's hard to change diets over many years in a study. But this was a study, uh, it's the MIND diet, it's a combination of the Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet. The DASH is a little more of a strict diet. Um, and they enrolled uh, 604 subjects uh, with normal cognition and then they followed them to see if they would come down with a cognitive impairment. Um, and the control group, uh, these, the body mass index was 35 or higher. So these are relatively overweight uh, volunteers. Uh, the control group had advice on cal caloric restriction. And then the treatment group had the same advice, same coach on caloric restriction, but then they added the MIND diet in too. And they wanted to see if adding the MIND diet would do anything differently. And it did not. You could see a similar, uh, both had some improvement in cognitive score. And they speculated that maybe it was just the mild caloric restriction that helped. Um, so we still have more work to do on the effect of these diets. Um, and then finally, I'd like to talk about ultra processed food. Uh, this is the Framingham Heart Study. And they followed people over about 20 years. They looked at cumulative incidence of a dementia. And you could see the people that had higher uptakes of ultra processed food were about 50% more likely to come down with the dementia. So again, we're seeing this ultra processed food effect. And then the, the graph on the right shows servings per day. And we can see between two to four servings per day as we get to that and higher, uh, the incidence of dementia is going up. Sleep has been a big factor lately. Uh, people that have sleep issues have more likelihood of having a dementia come on. And the theory is that during sleep, uh, we get more fluid flux through the brain, so more cleaning out of amyloid, uh, uh, theoretically, compared to when we're awake. Um, but the big question in sleep is, which came first? Some people argue that it's a very early brain degeneration disrupts sleep patterns. And it's the, it's the degeneration of the brain and Alzheimer's that causes poor sleep before cognition starts. But other people argue, no, it's the other way around. It's the poor sleep came first, and that's contributing to the dementia. So we really don't know which one is, is first now, but I still recommend to people to try to get the six or seven hours of, of healthy sleep. And then healthy lifestyle overall, again, these studies try to integrate multiple health factors, the mind, diet, et cetera. And people that have zero or one healthy factor only, you can see they're more likely over at each age range, to, the blue line there, more likely to come down with a, a dementia versus people with four or five healthy factors, the red dotted line, uh, almost 50% almost less likely to come down with a dementia. So it might be a combination of these lifestyle uh, factors. And there's a study called the FINGER study, Finnish Geriatric Intervention Study, that again, combines all these lifestyle issues. Because people, we want to focus on exercise and diet separately to learn what they do. But in the end, it might be the combination of these lifestyle uh, factors. So let's get to therapeutics for the last few minutes. Uh, we have a number of drugs that have been around for a long time. I've listed them here. These boost the neurotransmitters in that synapse. They make the synapses work a little bit better, but they don't slow down degeneration, unfortunately. So what we don't have in the field yet is a drug that can slow down degeneration, although there's one that recently came out we'll talk about. Uh, people ask me about supplements all the time. Uh, this graph is just comparing people who are low in vitamin D versus higher vitamin D. A vitamin D deficiency might increase the risk of dementia, but adding more vitamin D to people won't necessarily help or treat it. The bottom line with supplements is, and I can summarize thousands of websites for you in one sentence probably, unfortunately, the bottom line is there is no supplement proven in a well-designed trial to delay onset of dementia or slow it down. That, that's the bottom line. You can talk about any supplement. There are these endless products like Prevagen, you can buy at CVS, no good evidence whatsoever. I hate taking hope away from people, but these products don't have any effects. Okay, metformin is an old diabetes drug. It's touted to maybe slow down aging. People ask me if they should be taking it. Uh, it might, it's touted to maybe it'll slow down or reduce chances of getting dementia. Uh, no, ev no consistent evidence for that. This was a big, huge uh, study here. They looked at thousands of people. No evidence whatsoever for met metformin. So here's one drug that is FDA approved, lecanemab. This is an, an amyloid antibody that's given intravenously. And this antibody goes inside the brain and clears amyloid out of the brain. You can see on the PET scan here, the reduction in amyloid uh, by lecanemab. 
Um, and it, you can see the graph in the middle there. Uh, over this drug was tr this in this trial, they were treated for 18 months, and the cognition still gradually got worse in the placebo group, and it still got worse in the lecanemab group, but a little bit less worse. So 27% less worse on lecanemab. And people are debating now: is this clinical effect? meaningful enough, because it's a really small slowing of clinical loss, unfortunately. It's a very small effect. And at the same time, this drug has significant side effects. About 20% of the people got a, a form of a swelling of the brain or edema of the brain. Some had, had some hemorrhages of the brain. They're getting intravenous treatment every two weeks. They have to be monitored frequently by MRI scans. So it's a, it's a personal and difficult decision whether or not somebody uh, with um, my early stage Alzheimer's would want to be on this drug. We can talk about that, that more. And finally, I'd like to share a little bit of our experience developing a drug for Alzheimer's. It kind of highlights what this is like to create a treatment that will prevent or, or slow down Alzheimer's. We created a drug that affects all three of these mechanisms I talked about. And uh, beyond our control, this drug ended up on the cover of Time magazine a, a, few, week, a few years ago, uh, just because our journey in developing this has been unusual. Um, so we created a small molecule that can be taken orally that protects the synapses and neurons from amyloid and these other features. So we can take a neuron from a mouse, uh, grow it in a dish, and if we expose it to amyloid, its processes get ex this excessive curvature. That's a sign of a degenerating uh, neurite, uh, neuron due to the amyloid. But if we add the drug called C31 there, it protects the neurites from the amyloid in a dish. And then we can go uh, into mice and look at neurons as well. And you can see those little fine uh, uh, hubs. Those are the spines there, those little black uh, little nubs there. And we, we expose them to amyloid in the middle panel. Uh, we lose those spines, but if we have our drug present, the amyloid is no longer able to damage th those spines. Remember I said, if we want to save anything in the brain, it's those spines, right? So here's a drug protecting those spines from amyloid and protecting them from tau. That's been the goal. And so we uh, did all the studies necessary to bring this drug to humans, and that's my colleague Steve Mass and I visiting the FDA and going through all the testing uh, that get to get to human. We did a phase two trial in Alzheimer's patients in Europe, five different countries there. Um, this is my wife, Anne Longo, and I at a clinic in Barcelona. Um, and we had to start a company to get these trials done, and Anne's the founding CEO of our company and made all this possible for, on the financial end. We also had NIH funding. And this was a blister pack that one of the patients and their families brought back when we were visiting that day. It was very emotional seeing a family come back with this empty blister pack because they were taking a drug you know, that we created in our lab. Very, very meaningful for us. Anyway, the good news was that this drug is significantly slowing degeneration in the brain. This is a FD, what we call an FDG PET scan. And everywhere in the red is in the brain where the placebo patients were having degeneration in those parts of the brain that are critical. Uh, they, these are the parts that degenerate in Alzheimer's. But in the placebo group, unfortunately, had that degeneration like we expect. But in the purple down below, those are the parts of the brain where there's a statistically significant slowing of that degeneration for the patients that, that took this drug. So we're really excited about that finding. And finally, um, I know this is a complicated slide, but that black line under the zero is, uh, these are abnormal proteins that are accumulating in the spinal fluid of patients way before their dementia starts. So 10 years, minus 10, minus 20 years before the dementia starts, they're abnormal proteins already accumulating in the spinal fluid. Um, and then the dementia starts. And what we found about, about our drug is those abnormal proteins that are accumulating 10 and 20 years before the dementia starts, our drug is normalizing those. So we think that maybe this could be a drug that you would take 10 or 20 years before your dementia starts and delay the onset. If we can delay dementia onset by only 10 years, we reduce, we eliminate 90% of all Alzheimer's. Uh, it's just a very highly leveraged effort. If we can delay it by 10 years, which I think we can do, we eliminate 90% of Alzheimer's in the world. So potentially big impact there. Um, and then, so now we've designed a big trial that, that could go for FDA approval. Uh, there would be a placebo group, a drug group treated for 18 months, and then after the blinded period, uh, everybody gets to be on the drug uh, for 12 months. So we're, we hope to be able to start this trial soon. 
So I wanted to thank everybody in the, our Stanford uh, uh, Alzheimer's Research Group. Uh, we have a lot of great stuff going on at Stanford. Uh, this is the Iqbal Farouk and Assad Jamal Alzheimer's Center. It's our families and patients that make a lot of this uh, possible. And we're continuing to work on age-related mechanisms, better, even better imaging and blood tests, and really coming up with additional uh, treatment. So I'd like to thank everybody for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Longo. Wow, what a lot of great information, a lot of hopeful information. Yes. Some a little not so much, but. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm very positive about what we can do. Yeah, exactly. So as expected, we have a lot of questions. Just a reminder, please submit your questions using the QR code. Okay, our first question. I've heard that you can't definitively diagnose Alzheimer's until after someone has died. Is that still true? That's been true throughout history, all the way up to until very recently. So I, I think it used to be that at autopsy, we would look in the brain and that's when we really knew if somebody had Alzheimer's or not. Um, and that would create a lot of confusion for families because they would hear about a parent or relative that died of a, with a dementia. They were never sure if it was Alzheimer's or not, a lot of speculation. <clears throat> but I think now with the, some of the tests I mentioned, the blood tests, or the uh, PET scans, especially the blood test, that'll revolutionize things. That tells us with more than 95% accuracy that there's Alzheimer's pathology in the brain. So that'll really change the, the discussion. Okay. Can you address how crossword puzzles and creative activities like art, music, and writing affect cognition? Uh, yes, yeah, important okay. question. Crossword puzzles and these other activities. I think, um, I think being sedentary and doing a cognitive activity might not be enough. Um, so, you know, there are companies that market software to do so-called brain exercises. So you sit in front of your computer or on your phone and you do so-called brain exercises, right? And it's been very controversial. You'll probably get better at that particular activity, but most of the studies suggest it won't delay getting dementia or it won't make your cognition better. It's been controversial. In fact, the Federal Trade Commission filed a lawsuit against one of these companies for marketing that brain exercises would, would improve your cognition. I've had patients in my clinic. Uh, I think these, these brain exercises can be fun. I've never really done them. I've had my patients tell me about them. They are excited about them. I don't want to take away that. But then I say, okay, that's great. Now tell me about your exercise. And there's no exercise. Um, and, and the sitting in front of that computer is not gonna do it. Uh, it's just exercise is so much more powerful. Now, the Alzheimer's Association says, well, do your crossword puzzles. Um, I don't even like crossword puzzles. Um, I'm not very good at them. And so I, I think cognitive activity is important, but I don't think it ranks up there with exercise and nutrition. But there is one cognitive activity that does register. That's what I call cognitive engagement. Um, the, the social engagement, the most complicated thing in your environment is another human being. Um, so social <laughs> engagement, um, having a mission. People have formally studied people who have some kind of mission that might be their grandkids or their volunteer job or the boards they're on, some kind of mission. Or maybe it's their family's just survival, but a mission and being on a mission reduces dementia risks as well. That's the kind of cognitive exercise I think can be helpful. Okay, very helpful. Next question, my husband has depression and anxiety. Do these conditions or the medications he takes for them increase his risk for cognitive impairment? Yeah, depression and anxiety. So we do know that people with you know, chronic depression um, are at some higher risk uh, for dementia. And if the anxiety is a chronic stress, there can be some increased risk. One of the theories is that with forms of stress, there's a hormone called cortisol that's increased. And we know that cortisol is hard on the neurons in the hippocampus, the part of the brain that's important for memory. So there is some basis for that, but it tends to be cro fairly chronic, uh, severe uh, um, conditions. In terms of the medications that are used uh, for depression, uh, at least the newer medications that don't have the anticholinergic effects, they're generally probably safe in terms of, I'm not aware of any significant increased risk of those medications and coming down with the dementia. Okay, that's promising. 
What should we anticipate regarding long COVID's chronic brain inflammation and its effect on health? Yeah, well. um, long COVID, important area. One of our faculty here at Stanford invented a kind of PET scan that can identify uh, inflammation in the brain. Remember I shared those microglial cells. So she came up with a, a PET scan that can detect those microglial cells from being overactivated. And we're using that kind of strategy, what people are seeing now, that in long COVID, there's some active inflammation uh, in the brain, right? Mm -hmm. Now, having chronic active inflammation in the brain, I think will be hard on the synapses. So long COVID has not been around long enough yet, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if five years from now or so we're, we're seeing, okay, long COVID might be a, a risk factor. Right. How is coffee? beneficial or harmful yeah. to memory and cognitive <laughs> function. Yeah. Are we sure you want to hear the answer yeah. to this? Yeah, sure. so <laughs> I'm all, well, with alcohol, I'm always disappointed because there are studies saying it might be harmful, right? Um, they're mixed, as I said. But coffee is the one last substance I'm aware of that I've never seen a negative study on it. Um, <laughs> uh, so it's just great. Uh, <laughs> so I, I think uh, acutely coffee can enhance cognition, as most of us know. Um, coffee, you know, has, like most plants, has flavonoids in it besides, you know, not just the caffeine. And so in general, these flavonoids are antioxidants, and so that can be beneficial in terms of brain inflammation. So I look at a lot of epidemiologic studies, and I would say a coffee, if anything, would be a, a plus, but it's not known to be a big, huge one. It, it won't save you. Okay. <laughs> but we can still enjoy Exercise our... <laughs> is still more important. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> So maybe we should do crossword puzzles while running on a treadmill and yeah. have coffee yeah. after. Well, you know, there was a study where they put people on a treadmill and then they put a screen in front of them and they had to do computer games while they were on the treadmill. Um, and luckily none got hurt, but... I was just gonna say, the orthopedic <laughs> surgeons yeah. like that one, right? But the people that were doing both, they think had a little more benefit than just treadmill only, uh, so. Right. Yeah. But don't try that at home. I don't. <laughs> Okay, this might apply to lots of people. If I have a family history of Alzheimer's, when should I see a neurologist to have my cognition tested? Yeah, this, this, is, this question is so complex now and it's changing, I think, in an exciting way. Um, great, you have a fam if you have a parent with Alzheimer's, you're two times increased risk. If it's a grandparent or an aunt or uncle, it, it's less of, a, of an effect on risk. It's really having the parent. Okay, twofold risk if you have a parent with Alzheimer's, right? Um, and then if your cognition's normal, what do you do if you're at twice as much risk? Now, traditionally, I'd say, well, there's not much you could do. Just make sure your lifestyle and exercise try to optimize that. But now that we actually have a trial going on, that treating people that have normal cognition, so if you were in this situation, you might get the APOE gene tested, or you might get this new blood test, this tau 217, that tells you if you have amyloid pathology. You might, and so, so you might say, I'm gonna get the blood test. The problem is, I think it's a little too soon to act on these blood tests. This is a really important question. Right. Who should get this blood test, right? So if you have a family history and you're worried about it, you might be thinking about getting this blood test. But when people get tests, I always say to them, is there something actionable you will do? Right. Now, some people say to me, well, if I have an abnormal blood test, I'm gonna start working out. Um, um, I'd say you should be exercising anyway. Um, <laughs> Right, or I'm going to start eating a healthy diet. I say, you should do that anyway. You don't need a blood test to tell you that. But if you get this blood test and had uh, evidence that you have the brain pathology, un until recently I'd say, well, there's not much you can do with that um, in terms of actionable thing. But now we've got this study going on, right, where people are enrolling to take one of these amyloid antibodies to clear the amyloid out of their brain, even though their cognition is still normal. And the hypothesis of this study is that while your cognition is still normal, if we can clear that amyloid out, you're gonna be much less likely to come down with a dementia. That's the theory that this, and we're offering the study here at Stanford. It's not an easy study to be in. You're gonna be in it for years. You're gonna be coming into a lot of visits. You're gonna be getting intravenous treatments with antibody. I talked about the risks of this antibody. So it's a personal decision, but your question is so important because it is changing the, how we think about these questions. And we don't have all the answers yet. Right, I just know, I mean, typically you don't do a screening tool unless there's something you can do about it, right? But. Right. Um, now, yeah, you typically don't screen unless there's an actual item. 
Now, if, if people are, do have some symptoms, though, that changes screening. So I like to think of screening in the two different categories. Either you're normal and you just want this information. That's one context. And that's the one you're talking about. You sure you want to get screening if you're normal and there's nothing you can do about it. Or if you're having symptoms, and I, I, I would see a neurologist to really know if cognitive symptoms are significant or not, if they're mild, because they're not always significant. Um, but if there's clearly a cognitive issue going on, it changes the context of the screening and, and, and the value of, of the right. information. Right. <clears throat> okay, does the use of a statin increase the incidence of dementia? Yes. Or reduce it? Yeah, statin. <laughs> complex question. The two levels with statin. Um, in, a, in a very small percentage of people on a statin, when statins first came out, and this was maybe 1% or 2% of people on the statin, um, they were thought to have some little bit of impairment of cognition and some muscle inflammation as well. So, you know, people ask about muscle pain when, right. you're, when you're on a statin. Um, but then the pattern has not been so clear. So. Um, I don't worry too much about acute use of statin. Now, in the long term, it was hoped that statins are quiet some of this inflammation in the brain and that taking a statin would uh, slow down dementia. Right. And so there were two big trials by the large pharmas that, that uh, make statins, and both trials, unfortunately, were negative. So statins had no effect on big trials of slowing down okay. cognitive loss. So that's why we don't use it as a dementia treatment per se. I mean, to the extent it inhibits inflammation, it could theoretically be helpful. I wouldn't right. feel badly if I were on a statin, right. but we can't call it a treatment. Okay, thank you. Can meditation or mindfulness practices help prevent or improve cognitive impairment? And then what is the impact of stress on yeah, cognition? The, the way I look at mindfulness uh, or meditation practices is um, those have been studied. Um, and to the extent that they reduce stress, I think that could be helpful. I mean, the question is also about stress. So we talked about high levels of stress chronically uh, can impair cognitive function. Uh, uh, function. So, the, so meditation and mindfulness, I think, can be uh, helpful there. Um, there are a small, what I call associative studies, and people who meditate or practice mindfulness uh, might be a little bit less likely to get a dementia, but those are small studies and the effects aren't huge. They aren't as large as, say, we see with exercise and diet. So I say it's some benefit, uh, but not at the level of, say, exercise and diet. Okay. And are there any studies on the use of stem cells to reduce or reverse mild cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's? Yeah, so stem cells uh, get asked about, and there, there have been some studies, especially at the preclinical pre level, at the mouse level. Um, there haven't been uh, human trials of putting stem cells in the brain for uh, cognition. Um, and I think application of stem cells is somewhat uh, limited for our problem, because this is not a problem of losing the cells that we need to replace. It's, for example, in Parkinson's, there's a part of the brain where you're losing the cells that are important for motor control, and you may want to replace those cells. So we talk about stem cells in Parkinson's quite okay. a bit. But in Alzheimer's, it's not so much losing the cells, so we don't have cells to replace, it's losing those connections, right? right? And a stem cell is probably not going to help us deal with losing these connections. Okay. So stem cells are not a big part of the Alzheimer's field. If you were to go to a five-day international meeting on Alzheimer's disease where there are hundreds of sessions, you might barely find one session wow. talking about stem cells. It's, it's, it, for that reason, it's not a big part of the field. So they don't help preserve those spikes or no. those spines? No. Okay. Oh, and our last question. How can I learn more about participating in your study? Do you have a website where we can follow your progress? Yeah, so two things there. So um, there's the Stanford studies and then there's a study we're doing. So the study that we are planning has not started yet. Uh, we have to uh, you know, do all the preparatory work and you know, fundraising to make it possible. We're hoping it'll start maybe in about a year or something okay. like that. It takes a lot to get these studies started. When the study starts, typically a, a big phase three trial in Alzheimer's will be in 80 or 100 locations. And they're typically both in North America and Europe. So there will be sites in the Bay Area and probably at Stanford when it starts, but it, it, it's at least a year away. But if people are interested in studies in general, 
on our uh, Stanford Alzheimer's Research Center website, in our department memory clinic uh, website. There is a information there on studies. At any one time at Stanford, we have four, five, six active trials going on. Okay. Either I mentioned the one to prevent getting in dementia or if people already have early stages of a dementia. We have trials going on here at Stanford. And, what I, and there's a, a contact info on that website. And it, what you want to do is talk to a study coordinator and just figure out if you're eligible for a study or not. Um, uh, my, my patients and families, we talk about studies all the time. And the just generalities about studies, almost all of them will have a placebo group. Um, that's just unfortunately the only way we can do a study to know if a drug works. But, th but the good thing is most studies are designed so that at the end of the, what we call the blinded portion of the study, everybody, it's, then we do the open label part where everybody gets to be on the drug. So even if you're on placebo, you get to be on the drug that's not generally available. So we try to reward people for taking that risk of being on the placebo. Okay. And when you see studies in the news, I always pay attention to placebo. I can't tell you how powerful placebo effect is. There's good and bad to that. And we've done studies here at Stanford where we've had patients respond, had miraculous res responses to various things, uh, Parkinson's studies, all kinds of studies. I mean, they'll come in and say, you've changed my life. I know I'm not on the placebo. The family tes testifies to that. Obviously, my husband is not on the placebo. Thank you so much. And then the study's over. We unblind it, and it's really hard to let somebody know you were on placebo. Um, yeah. and, and so, yeah. and the reason why I say this is for two reasons. Um, the brain is a very powerful plastic system. You, you know, we can really influence our brain. And that, so maybe that's a good thing that people can, you know, do something. Um, and, but it, it just tells you how important placebos are. And I see studies in the news all the time where people said, this changed my life, this cured me. Guess what? No placebo group. So we'll never know if that treatment worked or not. Good point. Um, could you say, so the Stanford Alzheimer's Research Department, well, well, is that where? Well, there's the yeah, Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, ADRC. Okay. Or you could just go into Stanford Neurology and you'll find the memory clinics. So okay. The Stanford Memory Great. Clinic. Yeah. Thank you. And thanks so much for all that incredible information and hope. Okay. Thank you, everybody. So.